The Lincoln Project, as Jared Jackson pointed out on Twitter, is just home run after home run. Awful people probably disagree with them on everything, but their ads are something. Take a look at this. When Donald Trump came out of hiding this week, he didn't do it to bring us together or heal the nation. He wasn't there to offer words of calm and comfort. Instead, he became what we always feared, evoked the worst of our past, threatened our governors and states. He ordered our own soldiers who fought in Iraq and Afghanistan to flood the streets, instructing them to turn against Americans, used churches and the Holy Bible as political props. He didn't invoke the Lord to give us wisdom, but to boost his polls, ordered an attack on unarmed protesters using gas, rubber bullets, and flash grenades. Washington transformed into a war zone for this coward. This is a time for choosing. America or Trump? Okay, Michael. So um, uh, we've talked about a few of their ads. Um, they're they're very talented at getting under the skin of the Republicans they target. And while obviously that's a sort of general argument against Donald Trump and where he's led America, it also is honing in on a few of the things that we know has really angered him recently. The coverage of the fact that he was you know in the bunker. They call him a coward. They talk about him coming out of hiding. It seems very well suited to anger him at the very least. Yeah, not to mention the, the the subtlety of calling themselves the Lincoln Project, taking Lincoln away from the Republicans um, uh, who try and use it, including the president of the party of Lincoln. Mike Pence always refers to the party of Lincoln. Uh, and now the Lincoln Project is saying, guess what? Uh, Abe is not or Donald's not Abe. Uh, I, I you know, this is a, an effective set of ads and, and it will have a cumulative effect of some kind because so many Republicans are behind it and are seeing it. And that with uh, uh, also, the the sort of the what they hope to be a bipartisan group of former presidents lined up around ads like this is going to be a, an important part of the optics of 2020. Yeah, um, and by the way, I can see from the comments that uh, most of the people watching this think again it was a very effective ad. Um, yeah, I, I there's there's this group. There's also. Um, is it Republican voters against Trump or something like that? They had an ad. It was like a, a American massacre or something like that a day or two ago. And uh, it is weird that the vast majority of the most emotionally resonant ads coming out are made by Republicans attacking Donald Trump. I don't know why the Democrats seem to be having so much trouble matching that. Joe Biden has had some good ads. There's, from my point of view, needless fear mongering about China uh, in there. He, sees, he, he seems to think he needs to to appeal to people who feel like we're being too soft on China. So him and Trump are now sort of competing on that. I don't like that necessarily. Um, but effective ad, what I'm curious about is, uh, I've been looking at recent polling. I know that you're familiar with it. We've seen that in the public polls um, over the past few months, uh, the, pers the gap, at least right now, between Biden and him has been growing up to eight or 10 points, 11 points in one poll that I saw. So that's the public polling. In response to that, Trump said that he has polls that show him winning, but apparently he doesn't because according to reporting in private polling conducted by his campaign, the president is well behind Mr. Biden. Those are in his, actually. Internal polling always favors the internal poller, right? Mm -hmm. So every candidate from every office who has enough money to poll and do their internal polling will always give you numbers that are better than the ones that come out in the public polls. It helps the campaign. It helps the candidate. Uh, that Donald Trump is talking about this uh, in such a way as, or his people are talking about it in such a way as their internal polling has him in a, in a precarious place. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and again, I, I try not to focus on any of these too much because it's still five months and you never know if the polls can move that far just over the past two right. months, they can theoretically move back. Although I did see, I think it was uh, Dave Weigel had tweeted out um, for the last four presidential elections, he had the Real Clear Politics uh, polling lead at that po at this point, the same point. And um, for 2008, 2012, 2016, it was right around 1.5 points for the Democrat. And I think Biden was up by 8.1 points. So a pretty yeah. significant gap, even though Trump is the incumbent president. There's the whole rally around the flag thing. The economy had been perceived to be doing well up until just a couple of months ago. Um, 
yeah. So I, it, it seems impossible to say exactly how this is going to go, but this is cer- certainly not, nothing about this is what Donald Trump was hoping 2020 would look like. No, and and at a time when you would rally around the flag, which is at a time of national crisis, which uh, the predating George Floyd during Corona, uh, the, he didn't get. He got a a, a, no, a zero sustained uh, rally around the flag. People did not come and rally around the president after a while, and that that was really hurtful to their chances. The other part of it is forgetting the poll numbers. Where do you go if you're Donald Trump? What states do you campaign in? Now he's down farther in in by more in in Wisconsin than even in Arizona. Do you go to Arizona, where the Senate campaign's up by 13, Mark Kelly on top of uh, um, uh, Martha McSally? Or, or do you go to Wisconsin and try and win that back? Are you precarious enough in Ohio and Florida that you have to camp out there constantly and then lose Wisconsin and Arizona? It's, you know, if you're running Trump's campaign, that's what becomes difficult. Where do you where do you go? Where, where are those votes? Where are those states? And there are fewer now for Donald Trump to choose from with only five months left. Yeah, he seems, from what I've seen generally in, you know, a sampling of swing states, the gap seems generally seems to be smaller, which is yeah. helpful. Um, but he apparently is doing uh, renewed spending in Ohio. I've seen um, some indication that they're going to be doing some work in Georgia, which is not yeah. what they expected. And, right. and you, you never know about these polls, but there was just another Texas poll, I think yesterday, that had him up by one over Biden in Texas. And I think we all agree that if Texas went blue, then that's just, you know, pack well, it up. Well, that's just it, John. And if you're Donald Trump and you know you're going to lose Michigan and Pennsylvania, that means you've got to go to some other state where you have a chance. Early in the year, before all of this happened, at the end of last year, they were talking about New Mexico and Oregon as places they would spend to try and make up for Michigan and Pennsylvania, try and narrow the gap a little bit. Those are states that are so far off the charts for the for the president right now that they have to go into these swing states just to hang on to them. And and they have to pick something else up. There's nothing the president at this point in time has a chance of picking up, of flipping. So he's got to hold on to the states like Ohio and, and to the fact yeah. that, like you just said, that they're considering even spending a dollar in Georgia tells you exactly where they are now. Yeah, I mean, we had that 2018 race there that was uh, so close. And on the whole... Like, there's still the possibility that he could take, just choose a crisis and take it seriously. Just, you have your pick of several crises. Um, With the whole rally around the flag thing, if he had gone against his worst instincts with coronavirus and had taken it seriously, I think he'd be a lock. There'd be no way to beat him, I think, that if he, if he was seen as being a responsible leader, um... But he wasn't. And now with this, he has a, another chance to rally around the flag. But what he's decided to do is rather than unifying and bringing the sides together, even in a shallow way, even in a way that's you know, blatantly opportunistic, he's not doing that. He's right. just deploying the military, which means that if like you might feel as a regular American, like, well, aren't I supposed to support the military or the cops? But look at what you are being forced to sign on to to do that now. You're going to have video coming out every day or two of beatings and tear gassing and all of that. You're going to have to be okay with that to rally around the flag this time. And, and you know, back in the 60s, 70s, easy. A lot of white Americans are perfectly happy to do that. I'm sure many white conservatives are still fine to do that. But is that an electoral majority? I, yeah. I hope not, at the very least. Yeah, I, I hope not too. And it's you know it's all hypothetical, and and so too is your theory that if he had handled this properly, uh, the point is he doesn't handle Corona properly, and he doesn't handle any crisis uh, mm-hmm. in a presidential manner. Had he done so, I don't think he would have been a lock. I just think it would have been closer in swing states. I I, I think yeah. before we knew about Corona, I didn't think he was a lock at all. Um, so I, I think all of it combined with a bad economy makes it a very difficult place for a president to run. Yeah. For more political news breakdowns, interviews, stories of activism, and me trying my hardest to care about the occasional big celebrity news story, subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the damage report. And you can ring the bell wherever it is so you don't miss anything.